Hello, this is Prof C coming to you from my backyard here. And as I'm recording it, it's just about two more hours until SpaceX launches some more Starlink satellites. And if you happen to miss that launch, or if I happen to miss that launch, well, we don't have to wait very long because it's just going to be about nine hours till the next one. And then if we miss that one, it's going to be just about 20 hours till the next one. SpaceX is launching satellites for their Starlink system at a huge pace. And I think they're in a big rush to meet several deadlines. And I want to explain to you what those deadlines are in this video. Because I think that the way that things are shaping up, Starlink is going to be the one and only planetary ISP for at least the next decade, if not longer. So hear me out on this. Starlink is an internal project for SpaceX. And each one of these launches generates no immediate profits whereas launching a government or commercial satellite would. Instead, they are burning through investor money in a race to build out their mega constellation. Now, there's undoubtedly going to be profits from building Starlink infrastructure, but they are well into the future. SpaceX makes millions when they launch a satellite for a company or a government, and they have a backlog of customers. They charge close to $70 million dollars, to launch a Falcon 9 rocket that can carry about 22,000 kilograms into low Earth orbit, and they charge much more to launch a Falcon Heavy. So why are they spending so much in this internal project? Why don't they dial that down a bit and launch stuff for other people and make millions in profits? Well, I think it's because SpaceX is under several deadlines that have them in a mad dash to get as many Starlink satellites into space as possible. The first deadline I want to cover is a FCC hard deadline. When they were approved to launch these satellites, they were given a deadline to complete this entire constellation. They would not be, they were only able to launch within these windows. I'll put up a table here that actually shows um, the different generations and the um, different phases of those generations and the number of satellites in each one of those. Okay. So you can see here that um, they, they have a deadline of March of 2027 20, for the phase one of generation one. Um, they're going to make this easily. They only have about three, 400 satellites left to go uh, in that particular phase. Uh, if you add this all up and you look at the um, numbers in that table, which I'll link to down below, um, there's about 17,000 satellites left to launch. Now, I will say that it looks like Phase 2 of Generation 1 seems to be abandoned, so it's probably more like 10,000 satellites left to launch in this window. But that's a huge number of satellites in the coming years. 80% of all satellites in orbit are going to be Starlink satellites. And this is not including the other launches they're going to have to do to replace existing satellites that deorbit or fail. Okay, that's... Deadline number one, that's a hard deadline. The second deadline is a possible change to the FCC approval process. How do you get these things approved of in the first place? There is a looming challenge right now to the FCC's exemption to consider the environmental impact on satellite launches. What is the impact that they have on our night sky on astronomy? Okay, And Starlink is having a huge impact on the night sky, might spell the end of ground-based astronomy, and is you know, has the potential to royally screw up radio astronomy as well. Here's a picture of the comet Neowise in a time-lapse photo, and you can see that it's dominated by reflections from Starlink satellites. All these impacts were known before the FCC approved these systems, but the FCC didn't consider the environmental impact of these mega constellations because in 1986 the FCC was granted a categorical exclusion to the impact review required by the National Environmental Policy Act. However, that exclusion is currently being challenged due to the impact that low-flying mega constellations have on our night sky, astronomy, and space debris as well. The Government Accounting Office found that the FCC has not sufficiently documented its decision to apply its categorical exclusion when licensing these large constellations of satellites. The FCC should have periodically reviewed this exclusion to ensure that they remain current and then it applied 
under, under the projects they were approving. Now, the space industry has changed radically since 1986, but the FCC has not updated its policy. Now, it could go on, but instead I'm going to link to some resources below where you can read the GAO report as well as another uh, very well-written uh, legal paper about these challenges. Okay, the next deadline is capturing first mover advantage. Now, normally I favor second movers in emerging technologies, emerging markets. However, operating a mega constellation like Starlink is so capital intensive that it provides a huge barrier for entry for other commercial services. If SpaceX can capture market share, it might not be possible for other services to enter this market. The more capital SpaceX puts into Starlink, the bigger the barrier. And as an unregulated service, Starlink could underprice its service long enough to drive off any co potential competitors. There are also other advantages that SpaceX has, such as having re reusable rockets and easy access to those at a very low cost. But my point is that the market for internet satellite service may have significant long-term advantages for the provider that's the first to the market. It may be that Starlink is Earth's first and only mega constellation for decades to come. Okay, and there's one more reason that Starlink might be the first and last planetary ISP for a while. There is a massive issue with space debris right now, and it just gets worse and worse with each launch. I'm going to put up a graphic here from the European Space Agency. That graphic, the bottom dark bar, that's actually the payload of satellite launches. You can see the uh, this entire thing is trending geometrically upward, but those are just the payload in that bottom bar. All the rest of the rocket bodies, fuel slag, carriers, the bits and bobs that break off, that's all the other stuff. So this is accumulating at a geometric rate, and it's only getting worse and worse as we get more objects and more launches. So there's a real danger that as more objects are in space and the more near misses happen, governments will pause the approval of new mega constellations <clears throat> until active Debris removal technology can be developed or the debris problem can be addressed in some way. So, to wrap up this video, I'm going to make three predictions. First, SpaceX will continue to launch at a furious pace. Okay, I'm not going on too much of a limb there. Because of the issues mentioned, SpaceX will be the only mega constellation for the next 25 years. And SpaceX is going to spin off Starlink and it will go public, not only to make SpaceX enormous profits, but also to spin off the potential liabilities as well. Now let me know what you think in the comments below. Feel free to leave any questions about other topics as well. And uh, we'll see you again soon.